Amen. We get to declare that we have hope. Unlike the rest of the world that is still searching and still longing and failing at finding that hope, we have found it. And it is in Christ, our living hope. What a joy to sing that and declare that together as a church body. Well, this morning we come to the end of our study of First Thessalonians. We come and we wrap up this letter, all five chapters of it that we have tackled. And we come to conclude, and as you can see, I've titled this message, A Growing Church. A Growing Church. Last time, if you recall, the message was a spirit-filled church. What does a spirit-filled church look like? And we got to delineate that, describe that, and talk about what does it really mean when we use that term, spirit-filled, especially in relationship to maybe a whole body of believers together. What does a spirit-filled church look like? And we saw that that really hinges very much so on the Word of God. Our willingness to desire and receive the word of God and then to discern according to the word of God. Well, as we come to the end of 1 Thessalonians, we now shift and we get to see what a growing church will look like. Because as we know, this was a great study for us because the church at Thessalonica was a baby church. A new church. Not, not very many months and years old. A young church that Paul spent a little bit of time with, saw a church established, and then was rushed out of town. And so as he's later on in his journey, he's writing this letter back to the believers at Thessalonica. And so we get to see the joy of what God had accomplished in his supernatural ability through the work of the Spirit, the gospel going forth, and a church being formed under such difficult circumstances and a short amount of time in Thessalonica. But that's not it. It doesn't end there. It doesn't end with the fact that, hooray, a church was established and they're still alive, but to progress and to move forward and to grow, of course, is the goal. For the church to mature is the goal. And so this morning we're going to see as Paul leaves off this letter, he leaves off with some encouraging notes and comments on this very subject. That the church at Thessalonica would be this, a growing church. A church that is not just simply surviving, a church that's not complacent or stagnant, but in fact a growing and progressing church in this way. So let's look at our text and let's finish our study of 1 Thessalonians and we look at chapter 5 verses 23 through 28. Paul ends the letter with this, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, Pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So we come to the end, and just like beginning of letters in the New Testament, it is often common for people to space out and think, okay, yada, yada, let's get to the good stuff. And so it's possible that you could come to the end of a book like this and do the same thing. Say, oh, these are Paul's final remarks, and of course, it's, you know, just kind of wrapping up his little, you know, letter to this church that we're not really a part of, so we can just skip over that and get into 2 Thessalonians or something like that. But no, there's actually a lot here, and this is good for us to consider as we look at what a growing church looks like. And we see this in in four parts for us this morning, so we're going to begin by looking at part one and what we see clearly as the Apostles' Prayer. The Apostles' Prayer. And this does seem like a fitting way to end. We mentioned that Paul had this habit of praying, and he would do it so often that it would even come in the middle of the letter. And that happened already in chapter 3. At the end of chapter 3, he burst out into a prayer for the Thessalonians. And so now we come to the end of the letter, and he prays again. He prays again. Look at verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at this one prayer here in in this one verse. And we see two clear things that Paul is praying for the Thessalonians. Paul prays for their sanctification and their preservation. You can boil it down to that. He prays for their sanctification and their preservation. Those are the two things. So let's consider this prayer for a moment here. First, let's look at his prayer for their sanctification. That's how he begins verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Right there, the word being used. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Notice a few things, though, about this phrase in Paul's prayer for their sanctification. First, let's just remind ourselves of the context of this prayer. 
This prayer for sanctification has a context. Where are we in the study of this letter? We're at the end. I already mentioned that. And Paul has given several commands in the second half of 1 Thessalonians. Most notably was the command for them to be sanctified. In fact, if you go back in your Bible to chapter 4, go back in 1 Thessalonians 4 and you look right there at verse 3, it was very clear. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Their sanctification. Their, their growth, their maturity, their looking more like Christ, their holiness. This is very clearly what Paul commanded as he shifted in chapter 3 to chapter 4 to start to give more application and commands to this church. Well, what else has he commanded the Thessalonians? Let's put this all in context. We see that clearly in chapter 4, verse 3. He said to be sanctified. And he goes on to say to abstain from sexual morality. In chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, he commands them to excel in brotherly love. In verses 11 and 12 of chapter 4, he commands them to live quietly, work with their hands, and depend on no one. In the end of chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, it wasn't just a neat passage about the rapture. He encouraged them to actually comfort one another with those words of Christ's return. In chapter 5, still talking about the return of Christ in the day of the Lord, in verse 6, he commanded them to keep awake and be sober. Later on in verse 11 of chapter 5, he again commanded them to encourage one another about the return of Christ. Then in chapter 5, verse 12, we had this rapid-fire series of commands. To live with love, respect, and peace among church leaders and one another in verses 12 and 13. In chapter 5, verse 14, he commanded them to minister to one another, to admonish and encourage and help and be patient with everyone. In verse 15, he commanded them to not repay evil, but to do good to one another. In verses 16 through 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything. And then in verses 19 through 22 of chapter 5, desire the word and discern through the word. Well, these commands have included a host of what I would say are, are both personal individual commands and corporate collective commands. Commands that he gave to the church that they need to live out specifically for themselves, and then they, live, they need to live out together as a church body. Both. Commands that are both throughout chapters 4 and 5. So the context of Paul's prayer for sanctification includes this dynamic. Individual commands to be obeyed, and collective commands for the church to obey. So all of what Paul has just written is on his mind as he prays for this, the sanctification of the Thessalonians. Namely, we could say this then, both their individual and corporate sanctification. Their individual and corporate together growth and practice of Christ's likeness. That's the context of this command. After laying out all these commands, Paul can't help himself. He says, you need prayer. So I prayed. I pray for you. I pray that the God of peace would actually sanctify you in this. But notice something else about this prayer of sanctification. Notice the channel of power in this prayer for sanctification pretty clear. Paul does not pray for the Thessalonians to sanctify themselves, although he's made many commands for them to obey. And to be very clear, this doesn't absolve the responsibility that they had in living sanctified lives of Christ-like obedience. We know this from a passage that we saw in our study and discipleship groups. A very great passage that puts both these things together in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Responsibility. You have responsibility, church. Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Both God and believers involved in this process of sanctification. But if we look here in Paul's prayer for the sanctification of the Thessalonians... Paul fixates on the work of God. He fixates on God's power, God's work in this process. He specifically says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That word himself is the emphatic word. It is the first word in the Greek sentence. Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. It's going to be God who does this. You need God to accomplish this sanctification. Furthermore, Paul calls God the God of peace in this prayer. And so this adds the reality that God's power is necessary for the Thessalonians to be corporately sanctified and at peace with one another. Things were not perfect in this church. We've seen that already. It's a good church, but it's not a perfect church. And Paul's recent commands indicate that there may have been some disharmony. There may have been some breakdown relationally and socially among the members of the church. And so what was there? There was a need for peace. He commanded that. For them to be at peace among themselves. And so Paul prays for the God of peace 
to be the channel of power in sanctifying this Thessalonian congregation. But thirdly, notice also the completeness in this prayer for sanctification. Paul prays that the God of peace himself would sanctify the Thessalonians completely. Completely. And this word completely is a unique word. It's used only once in the entire New Testament, and here it is. It pertains to, as one commentator says, being totally complete with the implication of meeting a high standard. In every way complete, quite perfect. And so Paul prays that the Thessalonian congregation would be totally and completely sanctified. This means that no person would be left out in the sanctification process. He's not shooting for a percentage. Man, I hope 70% of you guys can be sanctified. I hope there's peace in 60% of the church. As long as there's a majority of peace, then I'm good with that. That's not the prayer, nor is that the expectation. Instead, it's that there would be peace, that there would be sanctification completely. No complacency, no lack in the sanctification process. Paul prays for a genuine sanctification to sweep across the entire church, causing all of them to be more like Christ. So this prayer for a complete sanctification would overtake the whole congregation, and you would see the growth in each individual within the corporate whole of the church. And so this is where Paul moves next in his prayer for the Thessalonians. But before we get to that, we can reflect for a moment. How is this first half of verse 23 evident in a growing church? I think it's a model of how we can pray for one another. That's simple. When we read prayers like this in the Bible, it is so easy. It's just right there for you. It's fruit that you can pick right off the tree and move it into your life. You can do this today. You can do this now while I'm teaching. You can continue to make this real in your life. You want to be a growing Christian and you want us to be a growing church? Pray this prayer. Pray this very prayer. It's okay. You're allowed to copy. You can take those words and you can genuinely mean it from your heart and pray to God, God, would you take Mission Community Church and would you sanctify us completely? Would you yourself, God, the God of peace, sanctify this church completely? Leave no, no corner un, untouched. Come and sanctify all of us. Pray that God would do that. We need it. We want to be a growing church. And it has to start with some prayer. It has to. And you'll remember that I said that Paul prays for their sanctification, but he also prays for another thing here. He prays for their preservation. So let's examine that. We, we turn now to examine Paul's prayer for their preservation in verse 23. He already said, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. He goes on and says, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's notice a couple things about this prayer for preservation. First, notice the completeness of this prayer for preservation. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. He's really concerned about this idea of completion and completeness. He really wants sanctification to be for the whole church. And he really wants this preservation to be for the whole church and the whole person. It's very similar. This is a similar word, too. He says, may your whole spirit and soul and body. Paul's not content with the half-hearted, hypocritical Christianity that tries to enter into heaven. Paul prays for the Thessalonians to have a full, complete, and wholehearted commitment to Christ that is preserved to the very end. To show the completeness of this prayer for preservation, notice Paul's thorough wording. He doesn't just use the word whole. Notice how he continues to go on and stack this up. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. Now, some have taken this verse and they've kind of fixated on a debate. What does this verse mean about man? What makes a man? What makes a person? What makes us human, you could ask? And so some people say, well, are we made up of two parts? Are we material and immaterial? And so we're dichotomous. We're, we're two-part individuals. And some people say, no, we're trichotomous. We're three parts because of what Paul says here. And I'm just going to say, to fixate on such a debate from this verse is really just to miss the point of the verse. That's not what Paul is wanting us to do. What he really wants to do is simply pray for a complete and whole preservation of the Thessalonian saints. That's what he wants. I would say if you want to know a parallel of what this looks like, it's very similar to what you find in the book of Deuteronomy that Jesus quotes in his life and ministry. You know this when Jesus was actually tested. Well, Jesus, what's the most important law? What's the greatest? And you know Jesus' answer. He says very clearly, he didn't make it up. He just took it right from Deuteronomy 6. 
Deuteronomy 6, the passage we know. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And so to take that verse even to go, okay, Jesus, what are you teaching? That there's three parts to a man or four or two? What are you saying here? I think he would laugh and say, you know exactly what I'm saying. Love God with everything. Everything you have. Your whole being, the totality of your existence is for God. And so what's Paul doing? Something very similar. He's praying for an endurance and a perseverance among the Thessalonian saints that is all-encompassing. Everything. Everything of them as individuals. Everything of them as a church. Paul prays that nothing would be held back or left unsurrendered to Christ when he returns. And so this brings us to our next observation in this. Notice also the culmination of this prayer for preservation. There's a culmination here, and it's seen, as he says at the end of verse 23, that your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's prayer is that the Thessalonians would be preserved to the very end. To the very end. The culmination of this preservation in Paul's mind is the return of Christ, the second coming. Just like the servant that worked until the master returned or stayed awake until the return of his master, Paul also is praying that the Thessalonians would be blameless and ready for the return of Christ. So why is this prayer important? Why is this prayer for preservation an important prayer to pray? Because any amount of holding back or failure to follow on the part of the Thessalonians would risk the very status of their salvation. Any holding back, any half-hearted commitment, any limping and, and going on the fence would question and bring to risk the status of their own salvation. If the work of salvation causes God's spirit to really dwell in someone, if when someone is saved they receive the spirit of God, then it follows that the work of the Spirit will be seen in that person's life. Sanctification will follow where there's actually been salvation. If there's been salvation, you will see sanctification. And if sanctification is completely being worked out in the life of a believer, then it also follows that they will be preserved to the very end. That they, in fact, will endure and preserve to the end. But a breakdown in sanctification and commitment to Christ would cause questions, wouldn't it? If someone is just not interested in following Christ completely, maybe a couple times a week or a couple moments in their year, then will they really be preserved? And will they make it to the end? If someone's not desiring to live for Christ fully, then have they really been saved to begin with? Those are honest questions that have to be asked. And so Paul prays for a complete sanctification that results in a complete and total preservation at the return of Christ. He's praying that the Thessalonians would be a consistently growing church that will then be presented blameless at the culmination of Christ's return. And so we pause again and we reflect at this point. Are we a growing church? Do we want to be a growing church? Do you want to be a growing Christian? The implications are massive. If we are increasing in our complete sanctification, then we look forward to a complete preservation and blameless status before Christ at his return. In other words, we stand before Jesus and we're not scared or afraid that somehow he's going to say, let's see if you make it. You don't have that. You have confidence instead. But if we falter in giving all of ourselves to this process of sanctification, then our confidence at the return of Christ, it diminishes. So what do we need? We need to pray. Pray for the total sanctification of each other so that we might be completely preserved by God when Christ returns. We must be a growing church and the stakes could not be higher. If you think of this idea of being a growing church and you almost kind of have it in your mind that there's this competition maybe and you get into heaven and you get to see, oh, what did we get? Did we get in the top 10? How did MCC rank? Where did I rank among other Christians? We have it all wrong. Completely wrong. The stakes are so high because the second that there's letting off the gas and a braking here and, and not really caring there and a little more distraction there, it brings into question the whole work of God to begin with. Have you even really been saved? Are we really even a church that's reflecting Christ? If so, 
then growth and progress will be indicative. It will be so clear. And then what happens? We are eager and excited to see our Savior. We're ready for the return of Christ. But we must know. At this point, you can think, yeah, that is a lot of weight on my shoulders. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned about this. This sounds scary. Let's bring some comfort to this thought. Next in our text, let's, let's consider the Lord's promise. The Lord's promise in the midst of such a thought of wanting to be sanctified, wanting to be preserved to the very end and knowing that everything is on the line, whether or not we are with God forever, we have a promise that is most helpful in verse 24. Paul writes, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Beautiful verse. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. After praying for the sanctification and the preservation of the Thessalonians, Paul writes a most balancing and here what we find a helpful promise. A promise that we have to cling to in our pursuit of sanctification. Because you feel like, I don't know about you, but my sanctification isn't this nice steady stream going up. I kind of feel like I, I, maybe I am on an escalator, but I'm a yo-yo and I'm dipping every now and again. I don't always feel like I have this nice steady stream upward. And so what you need is a promise that you can cling to. A promise that God will sanctify and he will preserve those that are his. God will not fail in sanctifying and preserving his children to the end. Now, how do we know this? How do we know that God will not fail in sanctifying and preserving his children? Paul gives us two reasons in this short little verse, this short promise. First, the Lord will sanctify and he will preserve his children because he's the one who calls. He's the one who calls to begin with. He's the one who starts the whole thing. He's the one who kicks it all off in your life. It's the most glorious reality of the Christian faith. While we may not know every detail of people's hearts and who's in fact saved and who's not, that's not for you to know, nor is it for me. We don't know every detail of all that. But it's not unknown to God. God knows with certainty those who are his. He's not with us going, yeah, we'll see how they turn out. I don't know. That's not God's perspective, nor is that God's work. For God, there is no wavering. There is no mystery about who is saved and who is not. Again, how do we know this? These are big claims. Because the Bible affirms over and over that God is intimately involved in the whole process of salvation. In the whole process of sanctification and in the very reality of perseverance and preservation to the very end. Again, to bring in a verse from our discipleship group study of Philippians, Philippians 1 6, a good promise, very parallel. And I'm sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. A promise. And God who starts that work is going to complete that work. And not leave you hanging. That's not our God. Perhaps other clear scripture might settle this for us. In the book of Romans, where Paul speaks so clearly on this, in Romans 8, we have a a glorious description of God's involvement in all of your life as a believer. Not just salvation. Listen to the two verses that follow Romans 8.28. You know Romans 8.28, that glorious promise you hold on to. And then listen to what follows after it in verse 29 and 30 as well. Verse 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Speaking of believers. Now verse 29 in Romans 8. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now listen to this stacking up in verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is called the golden chain of redemption, and it is so for a reason. God doesn't make mistakes. God knows exactly what he's doing. Redemption is glorious because it's all of God. God is the one who knew you before you were even born. God is the one who had intimate relationship with you before you stepped a foot on this earth. And God is the one who then called you at that proper time to himself. And you couldn't resist it. You said, this is glorious. Who wouldn't believe this gospel? And you came running to him just like he planned, just like he did in his grace. 
And then in calling me, then justified you and said, this one here, my son, my daughter, not guilty. Righteous. Declared righteous because of Christ. And so he did that. He, he foreknew you and then he called you and he justified you. And Paul even goes so far as to say that you've been glorified. That as far as salvation is concerned, and as far as you are concerned, in God's eyes, you are a glorified saint in heaven. Your life is hidden with Christ on high. You're not slipping out. You're not absolutely, absolutely, oh no, you fell out of heaven. Oops, sorry. That's not the teaching of scripture. God has you. He always has. He always has. And so in this beautiful teaching from 1 Thessalonians, Paul's just reiterating that. God, the one who calls, is faithful. Think about the book of 1 Thessalonians alone. Paul has already said in chapter 1, verse 4, that the Thessalonians were chosen by God. In chapter 2, verse 12, he used the same terminology that they were called by God. And in chapter 3, verse 3, he said that they were destined for suffering. God has been in control of this whole thing chosen them before the foundation of the world, called them in real time in Thessalonica, and then even destined them in the process of sanctification and suffering, all in God's control. Since God is the one who calls us out of death to life, he is the one who will keep us firm to the end. But notice the second thing here in this short verse. The Lord will sanctify and preserve us because he is faithful. He is the one who calls and he is faithful. That faithfulness of God is a most comforting attribute to reflect on. He is faithful. He's not going to abandon his hand from that which he promised to fulfill. Those whom God has saved, he has promised that he will sanctify. And those whom God sanctifies, he will most certainly preserve to the end and glorify one day to be with himself forever. This is God's faithfulness on display. He doesn't pull back his hand. He doesn't change his mind. He sees it through. Our God is faithful. Left to ourselves, we would find every possible way and any means that there is to unsave ourselves. Left up to us, okay, now you're a Christian, now keep yourself there. We would find a way to run from God. But praise God, he's faithful. He's faithful with us. He does not give up. He doesn't let us. That which he started in us, he will continue to the end. And so Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians is undergirded with this confidence. The work of sanctification in true believers is upheld and advanced by a God who is faithful. And he takes our meager efforts and our meager prayers for one another and he multiplies them into greater degrees of Christ-likeness until that one day when we are glorified and with Christ when he returns. His faithfulness continues until the day we see him face to face. Then we will know with certainty that God is faithful and yes, he's done it. He's done it. We've asked the question, are we a growing church? Are we a growing church? We have to recognize that a growing church must have a balanced perspective in all this. They must recognize the ability that we have and the responsibility to be praying eagerly for this. God, sanctify us wholly. God, preserve us to the end. Don't let us just take the wrong path and don't let us just decide we're done with this. God, sanctify us and preserve us and of course you will. You're faithful. You're the one who called us to begin with. You will. If we are your chosen, if we are your called, then that's exactly where we're going to be on the day of Christ, glorified with you. And so we must keep a focus on the faithfulness of God. Otherwise, we're going to put way too much focus on ourselves and our own efforts. And we are going to drive ourselves into massive depression. Am I good enough for God? Am I good enough for God? Am I going to make it to the end? And the teaching of scripture is clear. On your own, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't have even reached out to God to begin with. But God is faithful. And that's why you can wake up each day and have the most wonderful feeling of relief and grace and forgiveness. Because of your performance. But because of Christ. And God sanctifies you. Not because you're amazing. Because his spirit is in you working. And God will glorify you. Not because you found a way to reach the finish line. But because that was his plan all along. And he's faithful. A growing church needs to have this focus. This proper focus on praying persistently for this. But at the same time, resting in God's faithfulness. And trusting in his work. We come to a third point in our text this morning. And we see the church's practice. 
a call to some commands that Paul leaves off for the Thessalonians. Some practices, some commands for them as he finishes this letter. The church's practice in verses 25 through 27. He says, brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Three commands are delineated by Paul for the Thessalonian church to practice. And so we look at all three of these in the three verses that are before us. In verse 25, first, Paul commands prayer. Paul commands prayer. Verse 25, brothers, pray for us. Brothers, pray for us. And it's a good reminder that Paul was not above anyone. I mean, Paul was not in this position where he could say, oh, I know you need lots of prayer. Oh, I'm good. Don't waste your prayers on me. Pray for yourselves. You really need it. It's not the case. Paul requested prayer often. Paul, too, needed much prayer. Think about how he requests for prayer elsewhere in other letters in the New Testament. In Romans 15, verses 30 through 32, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. He says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Philippians 1, 19 and 20. Yes, and I will rejoice for I know that through your prayers... And the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Colossians 4, 3 and 4. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. He asks for prayer a lot. He asks for prayer more than you realize, actually. There's other verses. He, he asks for prayer often. He didn't just practice prayer himself. He said, you are a part of this. We're all in this together. Please be praying for me. Pray for the fellow missionaries as well. But notice why he often asks for prayer. As you go through and look at all these passages where he's often asking for prayer, you see why. And it's not because it's really uncomfortable in this dungeon. I'm kind of sick of being chained to a Roman guard. I just am low on food. I haven't had a milkshake in a while. Right? Like he's not praying these things. He's praying so clearly, very much task-oriented, focused on what God has for him. Paul's focus is clear. He's there to preach the gospel. And if he's going to get out of jail, it's to give more opportunity for ministry to other churches. If he's praying that he gets a chance to visit a church, it's to minister to them and to keep the gospel moving forward. It's a beautiful example for us. We too should be asking one another, pray for me, brother. Pray for me, sister. I need it. And not just because I'm, I'm uncomfortable in that. I need prayer because I lose focus. And I forget why I'm here. In the, in the course of a week, why does God have me on this earth? What, are, what opportunities are before me? Am I even looking for them? And when I, when I even try to engage, is there an ounce of boldness in me? Do I have any courage? Am I speaking as I ought to speak? Pray for me. We need that. The humility to look at one another and say, I'm not doing great. Pray for me. Please. So Paul gives us this example of what a growing Christian in a growing church looks like. We are a praying church and we are humble enough to say, I need it. Pray for me. Second here in verse 26, Paul commands greeting of the saints. He commands the greeting of the saints. He says in verse 26, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. A verse that you've been excited to hear explained. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. It's interesting, one commentator noted this gesture of affection is commanded five times in the New Testament. Five times. And it refers to the cultural hug and kiss greeting of the first century, which for Christians was to be done righteously in recognition that believers are brothers and sisters in the family of God. 
And so it's commanded often. This isn't like a one-off where it's like, yeah, in Thessalonica, they're pretty weird. That's just kind of what they do. Yeah, it's kind of hot. I don't know, whatever. But there's a reality that keeps showing up in all these letters at the end of them that the apostles are saying, greet one another with a holy kiss. And so what else did this resemble? What else did this actually signify for them? Okay, everyone was doing it, but why? What did it mean? What is this greeting all about? Well, different commentators have brought out different aspects of this that are all valid. One aspect is just the simple reality of unity. You, you, are, you are one with someone, they're your friend, and you feel like you're on the same team, same page, there's a unity, and so you have this greeting of not some high five, but a holy kiss. And the early Christian communities, which embraced all social classes, slaves and free, various races, Greeks, Romans, Macedonians, Jews, the holy kiss would serve as an affirmation of their unity as brothers and sisters in the common faith. And so it's, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to imagine this, but we have to go back and, and really make that attempt and go, that's right. In these early churches, you had people side by side who really were not comfortable with each other. At least not yet. Slaves and free. The Greeks and Jews. And people that were saying, I'm, I don't even think I should be in this building with you. And if we're going to do a meal, I'm going to step aside and go eat my meal over there. I mean, that's the kind of awkwardness and tension that is there in the first century. And so to get a command like this, it's actually a, a pretty strong exhortation for them. No, greet each other the same, like you're unified, like you're one. Also, the expression of just love and affection among those who have been friends or family. Another commentator writes, it most closely parallels the use of a kiss among members of the same family as a token of their close relationship. Christians have come into the family of God, which knows even closer ties than those of any human family. Thus, it was appropriate that a symbolic greeting be adopted. So if this is the practice, they're saying, this is you in the church. You do this in your family, you understand the, the love and affection that's there, but now this is not just your family biologically, this is your family spiritually. Even also, another commentator pointed out the concept of peace and reconciliation. Commentator writes, the greeting kiss in the ancient world expressed not merely friendship, but also reconciliation and unity. So Paul's command, therefore, may have in view internal tension in the church and challenges the Thessalonians to remove any hostility that may be among them. And you call to mind certain passages where the, the, the prodigal son returns and the father runs out to meet and then they, he falls on him and hugs him and kisses him. Not just, oh, it's my son, I'll give him a kiss, good to see you. But this wonderful feeling and reality of reconciliation and being brought back into peace. Of course, also in our text, we notice that it's not just this, this symbol or this sign of unity and love and peace and reconciliation. He also says a holy kiss. Thus, it's somehow separated. It's set apart in some way. And so one commentator writes, as such, the adjective holy reinforces the bond between them that the kiss itself symbolizes and separates this symbol of their unity from the kisses they would exchange with others in their world. So perhaps they had business partners, perhaps they had friends and even biological family, and they had their, normally greet, their normal greetings of kisses with them, and now it challenges all that and says, this is set apart from all that. You're with these people for one reason and one, one alone. Not because you're in business with them, not because you are by blood related to them, but because you are tied to Christ with them. You are in Christ with these people. And so this is a greeting and a holy kiss that's set apart from all your other greetings that you experience during the week with the world. Well, of course, the question is, what does this look like today? We are not in a culture that's dishing out kisses left and right for greetings. What does this look like? One commentator sums it up well. The carrying out of this directive among believers today should be in a form that's acceptable to the culture of the community. What is important is that the members of the church should have some way of expressing visibly and concretely the love which they have for one another as fellow members of the body of Christ. This commentator suggests that it seems that a warm handshake today would be most acceptable under all circumstances. Of course, we have opportunities for this. An embrace, a hug, a handshake, whatever. But the point is clear. We're one in Christ. Let's treat each other like it. We're the family of God. Let's act like it. How does that work if we just ignore each other? How, how does that work if we just act like we, we don't exist? That doesn't make any sense. 
we're here together. And maybe you go into some seminars and maybe you've been in classes where you're like, hey, I'm just here to get this thing done and get out of here. I don't want to make any friends. I don't want to talk to anyone. Should the church be like that? I mean, that would just be terrible. It's me and God. I'm doing my thing. I'll show up to church because God tells me to, but I really don't care for the people there. Well, this is a good place to start. That would be wrong. And in God's eyes, you need to change that. To bring your worship to God when you come this morning meant not just singing praises to God and having a heart that is right towards Him, but having a heart that's right towards each other. An ability to actually have some affection and warmth in your greeting of one another. By God's grace, that's what we're after, especially when we finish this time, we're going to have an opportunity, after we sing our last song, to do a lot of this. And by God's grace, you're excited for that. You want that. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I want to greet them, and I want this affection to fill the room. That's what a growing church will look like. If Sunday after Sunday, your main concern is, when is this over? Can I get out of here? You're missing out on a huge command of God. Greet the brothers and sisters in Christ. Greet one another. We have to do this. We get to do this. It's an exciting part of why you hopefully came this morning. Third in verse 27, Paul commands the reading of the word. He commands the reading of the word, which in this case is his letter in verse 27. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. It's a strong term as reflected in the ESV. Other versions say, I adjure you, or I implore you, or I charge you. But why such a strong word and command? Because the word it really is literally that, that sense of put you under oath to do this. Well, perhaps he's making sure that the idle and disruptive are there to hear this admonishment for them. As we mentioned earlier in the chapter, he talked about people that had quit their jobs and sat around doing nothing, saying, well, when's Jesus going to come back and feed me in the meantime? Because I'm not working anymore as I sit and wait for Jesus to return. And perhaps Paul's saying, make sure everyone's there when you read this letter. Even those guys, those people. Possible. Or just the reality of what people were not able to do. Many people were not able to read. And many people relied completely on this. They needed someone to read to them to get the truth. Or also the reality that Paul knew as he was, had this conscious state, as he was writing these letters, that what he was writing was of the Spirit. And that it was, in fact, God's words being spoken in and through him as an apostle. And so all these things stack up that this was important. This was for all to hear. One commentator says, Public reading was the foundation of spiritual accountability. I.e., well, we all heard the letter, didn't we? Let's go and do it. No. No excuses. They just read the letter. We all heard what he just said. Let's go do it. There are no excuses after having that read. And so it's a reminder for us. That this is what we do every week. We, we devote ourselves to, to putting, putting ourselves underneath the word of God. And having it read. And having it taught. And so we're all clear. We read it together. We heard it together. We know what our task is. Let's do it. Let's be united in this. Let's be a growing church that says we're here to let the word dictate. Let the word dictate what we do. I will throw out a reminder here that it's pretty wild to think of the situation here where, again, the Thessalonian church does not have the full New Testament, does not have all of Scripture. And so they're relying upon this type of revelation, perhaps a letter from an apostle or a prophet within the church that actually has a word from the Lord. But that's what they're going off of. And to think of that reality, to think of that the, the fact that what existed then, 2,000 years ago, is still taking place in the world today. There are still pockets of this earth where people do not have the scriptures. They do not have the ability to even read the scriptures. They don't even know how to read, nor do they have someone that knows their language to read it to them. It's a pretty incredible thought, and it's a sobering thought for us to continue to pray for that, that that very work would happen, that MCC would somehow be a part of that, seeing the gospel and seeing the word of God go so that it could actually be read to people who don't know a thing about Christ yet. Part of a growing church, I think, is putting ourselves under the word in this way and letting it spread forth from us as well. Finally, we come to verse 28 and the last verse of our letter. And we see the Lord's provision. The Lord's provision. 
In order to be a growing church, in order for all this to happen, the Lord must provide, the Lord must do the work, and he certainly does. In verse 28, Paul says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. A need for the grace of God. It's not an uncommon way for Paul to end the letter. In Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians 16, he very similarly, similarly says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And it seems to be a nice conclusion, which is kind of a reverse of the introduction. If you look back at chapter 1, verse 1, and how it all started, the very first verse of this letter was, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. And now we come to the end of the letter and we see the God of peace and grace. Kind of wraps it up right where he began. Grace is our need for all that God has called us to do. If we're going to be a growing church, we desperately need his grace. One commentator writes, We need no more to make us happy than to know that grace which our Lord Jesus Christ has manifested, to be interested in that grace which he has purchased, and to partake of that grace which dwells in him as the head of the church. This is an ever-flowing and overflowing fountain of grace to supply all our wants. This is what we need to be a growing church, the grace of God. And so we've asked this morning, are we a growing church? And we've seen many ways that we can examine that and hopefully aspire to move forward in that. We need to pray for each other's sanctification and preservation. We need to pray that God is holy and completely sanctifying and preserving us for the return of Christ. We need to hope in God's faithfulness that he is the one who called us and he will surely do that work. We need to request and be humble enough to request prayer for ourselves, to greet each other warmly with affection, to receive God's word, and then, of course, to rely upon his grace. That will then make us a growing church. That will be a, a mark and an indicator of a growing church. Let's pray for God to do that with us. Heavenly Father, we bring this text before you and really the whole study of First Thessalonians because there has been much to glean and much for us to apply. Father, we, we ask that you would, in this time and in this morning, let each of us have something from these words that we know that we can put into action. Whether that is the commitment to your word or the prayer that we need to be praying for our whole church or the prayer that we need to be praying for specific people or even ourselves or the, the reality that we need to be asking for prayer or perhaps even the, the relationships that we hold and how we go about them and how we eagerly desire to know each other and to greet brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, what, whatever of these words, Lord, I pray that they would be on our hearts, that we would be considering how we might live them out being a doer of the word also, and not merely the hearer. And God, we look to you because you are faithful. You're the one who has called us, and you are faithful, and you will surely do this work in us of sanctification, preservation, and growth that we long for. Continue to grow MCC and make us a church that is not complacent or stagnant or stuck in the flesh, God, but instead led by your spirit. We pray this in your name. Amen.